Hi everybody, this is uh, Con Carroll with John Amato here for uh, This Week in Blog. Uh, John's with us for the first time uh, out in California, and uh, John, would you like to introduce yourself to Blogging Heads TV? Sure, Con, this is John Amato from CrooksandLiars.com. It's uh, really cool to be here. There's a fun little experience we're having. I had a little technical difficulties in my office, so I'm in my, uh, in my dining area. And uh, it, it's a lot of fun. A lot of people know Crooks and Liars. You know, we specialize, obviously, we're a, a liberal blog, and we do uh, a lot of audio and video, and we're probably the pioneers in that on the Internet as far as cutting video and getting it up to the people. Uh, myself, um, I come from two backgrounds. Um, I ran a small, I had my own business. I sold computer parts in the 90s, and I've always been a, a musician. And uh, I have a degree in music, and I wound up uh, as things progressed. I wound up playing with John Taylor and going on tour with Duran Duran for about eight, nine months, uh, recording for Ringo Starr, just playing with uh, Duff McKagan. And once you get into a sort of rock circle, it's really cool. It's just like anything else, where they, uh, where you meet other people, they hear you play, and all of a sudden you're playing a benefit. You know, I, I did a gig with the Goo Goo Dolls. It was just like that, where uh, John, the singer, just go, hey, Come on down and play a song. I mean, they hired me to play a sax solo on Broadway. So that kind of thing. And, and so I come out of the, you know, in a way a business, but also I've always been a musician. I won a scholarship in New York. I studied in Carnegie Hall for three years. And that's where my heart lies, in music. And it sort of led me into this whole um, political blogging life. Great. We're, we're very happy to have you. Was that long? Uh, no, it was not long at all. Not long. I, I, I was just wanted to get the Duran Duran highlight in there because when I was still working for National Journal, that that's how I always I had you pegged as uh, John Amato, the Crooks and Liars video and audio Duran Duran guy. So uh, you, you hit all the highlights. I always pegged you. Right? Yeah, well, you know, they're actually all the guys are really great guys. I I played with John Taylor first. He met me. I don't know if it was about ninety five and. You know, Los Angeles, you know, being, you know, playing music and knowing a lot of people, you tend to bump into people. And, and John had left Duran, and, uh, and I wound up recording for him, and then he went on a solo tour and asked me to go along, and so that's how the progression ran. So Duran was a lot of fun. All the guys were great to me. Um, you know, they treated me like part of the band. And it was really fun going, I tell you, I love Australia. Uh, Sydney was incredible, and so you know it's 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 a really interesting life. Um, well, well, speaking of world traveling celebrities, how about we segue into our first topic? You got it, brother. <laughs> <laughs> which is, of course, the uh, the ad wars, which kind of started the week and has morphed into the the racism wars. But uh, it all how did it that started... happen? By the way, how did that happen? I I blame Josh Marshall, but let's start at the beginning. <laughs> uh, so. Barack Obama comes back from Europe, and uh, the John McCain campaign cuts this uh, celebrity ad, which uh, aired in Colorado, Iowa, Michigan, Missouri, Nevada, New Hampshire, New Mexico, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Virginia, Wisconsin. So that's pretty much every major swing state except for Florida. Um, so th this is this was a, this was a pretty big ad buy. Yes. And uh, basically, uh, you had I mean, pretty much everyone's seen it. We'll provide a link, but it's uh, screaming. Uh, fans in uh, in uh, Berlin chanting Obama, Obama, and then basically comparing Barack Obama to um, Britney Spears and uh, Paris Hilton. Uh, so that that's what started off the week. Um, then uh, Josh Marshall, a Talking Points memo, uh, wrote a post, um, and, and he wrote, I note with interest today John McCain's new tactic of associating Barack Obama with oversexed and or young promiscuous white women. Uh, presumably all a herald for 2006, this will be one of those strategies that will matter, that will be a matter of deep dispute during the campaign and later treated as transparent and obvious once the campaign is concluded. The McCain campaign is now pushing the caricature of Obama as an uppity young black man whose presumptuousness is displayed not only in taking on airs above his station, but also in taste for young white women. So, uh, boom, all of a sudden we're talking about race, and then uh, Obama talks about uh, his pre his picture on the dollar bill looking different than all the other um, presidents and John McCain's campaign fires back and all of a sudden a discussion of celebrity turns into a discussion of racism. Well, I, I hear you. You know, Josh Marshall, you know, um, put down what we've all been seeing and hearing from the beginning. I mean, it's no secret to anyone that uh, this, you know, this is a standard Rovian 
Smith's tactic of injecting subtly into the campaign because you knew it was going to be, you know, what do what do, what were the Republicans going to run on? They, you know, it's been a disaster. Uh, you got more guys getting indicted left and right. You have, you know, page mail, sex scandals. And so really, this is a sort of a swing year if you want to talk about it. And, you know, it was Mark McKinnon who left the McCain campaign. And, and he left kind of suddenly when he knew Barack Obama was going to be the opponent. Now, he gave a very, you know, I could read what he said, right? But this is just a huge indication of what was coming. And he left their campaign saying, you know, Obama's a great candidate. He offers hope and change. And I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be in the middle of that. And what he was referring to is, look, he looked at the playbook. And he knew, this comes from Steve Schmidt, right? Let's, let's, uh, Steve Schmidt did the whole, uh, you know, uh, Samuel Alito's wife, uh, you know, getting so angry and upset that they, you know, the nasty uh, guys on the committee made her run and cry. You know, I mean, they're really great at that sort of screaming, scary, um, how would you say it, uh, you know, just injecting these, these hot button little issues that subtly touch people. And by, and by putting in Brittany and, and Paris Hilton, I mean, it not only touches on one thing, it touches on a host of things and causes huge reactions. I mean, this, this isn't like, I, I, did you hear, uh, I don't know if it was Rick Davis or, um, you know, it could have been Joe Liebman for all I know, they're all the same people these days. <laughs> but, um, you know, when he tried to say, well, we're just trying to say that he's a celebrity, right? He's just a, right. it's just a, but, but like, why, you know, you, you don't run commercials unless they are carefully chosen. Why run Britney Spears and and Paris Hilton in those ads if you're talking about celebrity? And then I'll get into well, the whole. I got a, I got I got some posts on on that topic. Uh, uh, John Riley, who uh, blogs for Newsday, made made the point you just made, in that uh, Britney and uh, uh, um, Paris are yesterday's news. And so he looked at a uh, Forbes Celebrity 100, and he saw that in the top ten were Oprah, Tiger, uh, the next Catwoman, Angelina Jolie, uh, Beyonce, David Beckham. Um, basically that, you know, Paris and, and Brittany were far down the list. And so, you know, he points out that, uh, you know, they didn't pick people who were married or men. They picked two, as he puts it, sexually available white women. Um, but then uh, Ross Doubt That at the, at the Atlantic responds that uh, except uh, for all those other big celebrities are famous for actually accomplish something. The celebrities uh, that people admire. Whereas the whole point of picking Brittany, and especially Paris, is that their figures are ridicule. Rid- ridicule. Famous for primarily being famous and widely derided as embarrassing airheads who not only exist to feed the paparazzi machine. In other words, if you're going to attack Obama's celebrity by comparing him to frivolous Hollywood types, Paris and Britney are exactly the figure you choose for the ad. So, do you, I mean, do you buy that at all? That, uh, you know, you can't really choose like a Tiger Woods who has won tons of golf tournaments. Or you, you can't choose well, like yeah, an you Oprah Winfrey. You can't choose, you know, the... The perennial, you know, you can't, you know, why not choose Michael Jackson, right? I mean, not Michael Jackson, excuse me, uh, Michael Jordan, who was, you know, was the hugest celebrity, or Will Smith. You know, I mean, sure, if they want to go this route, which is a low blow, and and just, you know, we're only in what? Now it's August, right? Just in July, and they're coming out with these type of ads. What's what's in store? It is dirty early, I mean, I'll give you that. You know, this is, just this the, is something you'd normally see, you know, early in October or maybe September. But, you know, see, there's other connotations in those two. Right? I mean, I wrote this on my blog, which was that, you know, why is Paris Hilton as famous as she is? Because of a sex, a porn movie that was on the internet. I mean, so there you relate a white woman, young, and sex to Obama, right? And now you have Britney Spears. Okay, why Britney Spears? Right, she, she's had in custody battles, she's losing her kids, that goes to family morals and values. And also, and then she's got drugs and alcohol problems, right? So then you go to an unstable rehab queen. And so you put those two images, and it juxtaposes to Barack Obama as a handsome black man, and you have about a hundred subtle messages that, that are distributed to these major swing states. And, and, and it's a tactic that they're going to keep using, and it's going to get worse. Um, and they're going to keep sending out these messages. And then they're going to say they're going to play the old race or sexism. You know, let's just even we're talking about race. What, me? In other words, they're the ones who say, and it's a smart ploy um, to do that. But it's like, you, you know, you immediately say that, that they're calling you a racist when you didn't. Because, you know, we can't forget the fact that Obama is the first African-American 
Democratic presumptive nominee for president. And so that is, you know, it, it, that is an issue that I guess is, it shouldn't be delicate, but it is. I mean, we've come a long way on race relations, but we haven't. Um, you know, we really have it, and, and Barack is is trying to be the president of the American people, and and so for them to come out first and say that 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 he's being racist, you know, it was really a joke. I mean, I have I just put an ad on my site. I don't know if you saw it that McCain had on his site where he put Barack Obama's face on Mount Rushmore. Um, he's got it in, on the dollar bill. He's, you know, and, and he was making fun of his appearance. So McCain campaign actually made fun of his face and put his appearance on all these items that he actually talked about refer when he was doing his stump speeches. So it's appropriate for him then to respond. They're trying to make me look weird. I mean, that's that's the call role. He laid it out in that article. I, I don't have it in front of me. I think it was in, was it in Newsweek. Where, where Obama is the, you know, the, the feminine, the, the elitist at the country club. Just the Wall Street Journal. Yeah, right. The Wall Street Journal. You know, drinking cocktails and smoking cigars and, and above it all. He, he laid out the groundwork. And, and for me, Karl Rove should not be on TV. He should not be allowed to be a pundit. Because to me, they're running a lot of stuff through Karl Rove. Um, you know, obviously his hands aren't going to be, he can't say he is a, you know, campaign guy. But, I mean... Everything Steve Schmidt studied under him, this is all Rovian tactics. And for me, he should not be on TV, first of all. But, uh, but you can see you know, what I'm talking about. In other words, the, the uh, McCain camp has already played with his face, has already played with images. And so for him to say they're going to try to make me look different, like I don't fit it, is truth. The McCain campaign did do that. And I have the ad on my site if you, you, know, if you want to check it out. Uh, no, I'm sure we can provide that link. Um... But, you know, it's, it's not like, I, I guess, uh, let me, you know, uh, defend the McCain camp here. It's, it's, it's not as though uh, Brock, you know, didn't leave himself open to these charges. Uh, Ad Age, uh, at their campaign trail blog, um, you know, notes that, you know, Obama is, is on, his whole family is on the cover of People magazine this week. And the, the campaign has gone off, have, has gone after a very uh, strategic and purposeful uh, presidential marketing strategy that in ad ages is present Michelle and Barack as the beloved Brand- Brangelina of the political world. They've been on People, they've been on Us Weekly, uh, Michelle's been on The View, they've been on Access Hollywood, they've been on the But Isn't that Report. typical? I mean, yes, they're on all these covers, right? But, you know, in a, a presidential campaign. Not, not Us Weekly. Um, I, I, you know, I couldn't tell you right off the top if John Kerry was on oh, Us I'm, Weekly. I'm a big Us Weekly but, fan. But, you know, so what? Okay, I understand that, you know. But it's still a presidential election year, and all these magazines are jumping in. I mean, the, like, the, the energy, you know, the Democratic primary was so intense for so long that I think it actually drew a lot more people in. Uh, you know, look at the cable ratings, right? I mean, you know, MSNBC and CNN beat Fox, and repeatedly. Um, and, and so there was just it, it, it drummed up so much enormous interest that I think it's it spread out to other venues that normally might not have their images on. But has the camp has the McCain campaign reached out to Us Weekly? I, I don't think I don't think they've reached out to Us Weekly. No. Well, they should say. You I, know, I can't say that for sure, but I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and bet. Uh, let me let, let me just throw throw one more item out there. Um, have you have you seen this video uh, from uh, this uh, comic? Group out of Philadelphia called uh, called uh, Bush versus Batman. You know, I actually have it in my inbox. I don't think I watched it yet. But um... well, you after this is over, go watch it. It is hilarious. Uh-huh. <laughs> but um, I, I wanted to uh, to play a similar game um, from uh, that uh, Jim Garrity at, at the corner uh, proposed um, after Obama's Berlin speech. Uh, Garrity wrote, um, "I loved it. There was not a ton to object to, and indeed, I like it a lot." Although I think I preferred it the first time when I heard it when it was sung by all those celebrities and rock stars back in the mid '80s. Oh wait, that was "We Are the World." Uh, and then Garrity has a, a list of uh, statements that are all from either uh, one Barack Obama's uh, Berlin speech or two "We Are the World." So, so do you want to take a couple seconds and 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 see if you can pick out which ones are Obama and which <laughs> ones are are "We Are the World"? Uh, I don't I don't have it. I don't have access right now to the internet as I'm talking to you. But that, that's what makes the game perfect, is that is that you can guess. <laughs> okay, go. I, I, look, I, you know what? It is, it, see, the, the, the Republicans are really good 
of this type of personal destruction sort of politics, which is part of politics, right? And and so the idea is that McCain complains and says that Obama never goes anywhere. So then Obama goes somewhere, and then he complains that reporters are covering it. And then he goes, you know, obviously keeps his trip going to see other leaders. And now it's like he's he's uppity, and they're saying this on TV, that he, he thinks he's the president already, right? He's the president. He thinks, how dare he? How you know? It's like, like so. They they have so much. No matter what Obama does, they'll always have ammunition to sort of try to tear it down. But let's go. So what what is this contest now? <laughs> okay, so I'm going to read you a statement. Okay, it's either from Barack Obama's speech oh, or it's man. from I don't, the song. Look, I don't care about we are the world. <laughs> I, I you know it it's it was never one of my uh, favorites. Well, you know, uh, it was a good sentiment. But yeah, you know, look, it's, there's probably similar, uh, you know, dialogue in there. But the actual, you know, the, like a lot of people commented on the speech. And, and yes, you know, it's funny when you listen to the pundits, all they talked about is that Obama didn't make a mistake, right? You see, if he goes and he makes a mistake, it'll be on 24-7 cable, right? Where, and to be honest with you, when McCain makes a gaffe, um, you know, it rarely gets any play. And so, and then they talk about it for like an hour or two, and then they move on to something else because they like John McCain. But um, so, I, I'm not that interested in playing the game be, because okay. I understand, you know, it's very easy, um, especially when he does a tour like this. To to like they, it's like uh, you know they're at a smorgasbord, and and that's the, that's what they're really good at. You know, really, this campaign should be right policy. It shouldn't be personalities, right? It shouldn't be John McCain against Barack Obama. It should be the policies of, of uh, Barack Obama. You know, it's pol- it's not principles. You know, and the media makes it into a personality contest, and we really need to talk about principles. And somewhere along the line in the Britney thing, this is what they were smart. They go, uh, oh yeah, offshore drilling, right? Off- uh, raise your taxes. Like, here's Britney. <laughs> I mean, it's like it's hysterical, but we should be having getting off personalities. And talking about policies because that's really and the people never get that and that's why they run these ads because you're working all day you have a family to feed I mean I know it was my father I come from you know strict working class in, in a story in New York and um, and you know are you at home watching um, you know the O'Reilly Factor or a Hardball no you, you're trying to pay your bills so when they shoot out these little images especially in the battleground states it's for one purpose only and it could have that effect. I mean, it, it might be like that. It could be terrible. But, you know, if I was the Obama campaign, what I would do is I would I would be firing back ads against him. Not personal attacks, but, you know, against his policies really hard because they're going to keep doing this, and I don't think it's an effective strategy, than to just sit back and then let the media defend you because because they are kind of scurrilous. I mean, his ad about, uh, you know, the ad before it about the whole Germany, he didn't go see the troops. I mean, that was despicable. Right, I mean, right. really, that was just an outright lie. But, um, you know, so it's like instead of being then just saying, you know what, this is not the type of campaign we're going to run, and, and they're trying not to. But you got to hit back hard. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm a Sicilian. You know what I mean? And <laughs> you got to hit back hard. Well, I am not the guy that wants to sit around and play defense. You know, I say, you know what, go on the offense, and hopefully they will do that. Well, one way they could change the conversation is by naming a vice presidential candidate. And there was lots of chatter in the blog sphere about, about that this week. Um, the, the big names out there this week, there's a, a front page Washington Post story, and uh, he's just, you know, right over the river there. But uh, there was lots of talk about Tim Kaine being the one. He was having meetings with D.C. with, with Obama's people. And uh, Marcos uh, uh, wrote a post basically uh, endorsing uh, Kaine as, as a good option. Um, he also uh, uh, sh- said he would like to see McCaskill, Senator out of Missouri, or uh, Kathleen C- uh, Sibelius out of uh, the, the governor of Kansas. Um, so he thought all, all three of those would, would be good choices to, to reinforce Brock's message of, of outsider agent of change, as he put it. But uh, he was in the minority, it seemed, in, in the uh, lefty blogosphere. Um, uh, Melissa McCune, who actually used to work for Edwards at Shakespeare's mm-hmm. Sister, had some very harsh words about Tim Kaine, calling him a gay-baiting dino warhawk whose personal views on abortion are roughly the, in line with George W. Bush. And uh, Matt Stoller, open left, um, had a, highlighted a pretty scathing critique of his uh, tenure as governor of uh, Virginia, 
from Raising Cain, which is actually named after Tim Cain, um, a commenter there wrote, from his repeal of the estate tax to his abandoned plan for universal pre-K to his opposition to embryonic stem cells, from his failed transportation plans to cozy relationship with Dominion power and his reprehensible support for the wise, wise coal plant, the Kane administration has fulfilled every early fear and never failed to disappoint progressive Virginia. So uh, did, I, did, did you have a, a post on uh, yes, Kane yeah, up I or put down? Yes, I um, You know, I think, you see, during the whole primary, I mean, if people were following, um, you know, you notice, like, you know, Barack Obama was not running. You know, there was that National Journal article, right? And it was a factually horrendous article that said that Barack Obama was the most liberal senator. Okay, it's, it's, it's a, it was not an article. It's a it's a yearly it's a ranking, ranking exactly. Out. And they did that to Kerry. But when you look at his voting record, okay, when you you know because that's what we do a lot. And I had uh, Howie Klein come on and, and write, and we did a lot of posts actually pushing back on that journal because immediately that comes out, and then what happens? The pundits go on TV and they go, uh, yeah, well you got to worry about uh, you know. Senator Obama is the most liberal senator. I mean, you know, as if that's a bad thing at this point in, in a country's history, right? But um, but that's like they try to tag that, but it's just not true. And now, if it was true, it's fine. You can do whatever you want, but when it's not true, you have to push back on it. And when you look at his voting record, I think before he ran for president, he was about ranked, I'm doing off the top, about 24th out of, out of all, you know, 49 uh, Democratic senators, I believe, 50, you know, Count Joe Lieberman. And um, and after he, when he started to run for president, he actually even became more conservative and went down to, like, the bottom ranking. So, you know, I, I, that was flawed, and it set up this whole sort of canard. And Barack Obama never ran as a super progressive liberal. He just wasn't. Now, so to see as he's running his, his uh, campaign now, you know, he has not been running a left-wing, um, you know, or what we feel, I mean, I feel that the country is ready for, I agree with them, we are ready for real change. The policies of the Bush administration have put this country in such a hole that the, the me, America, what I believe, the American people want a real shift. And you have to shift in one direction. But, um, but Obama is wanting to be more to the middle and reach out the other side, and, and that's all fine. That, you know, that's his choice, and he can run his campaign like that. Um, so what so, we're so looking you're, you're for, I'm sorry, is we're looking for, for a VP on our side is we would like to see someone that is more to the left, that is a true progressive. And Tim Kaine, I mean, if you just look at choice, right, choice is, is, is a cells. major issue for, for the Democratic Party. Um, and, and for someone who is, is not for, you know, a woman's choice, that, to me, that, that's almost a disqualifier. Um, so I don't agree with Marcos in that in that respect. And I actually went on the limb, and it's pretty interesting, um, which is I thought if he wanted the best VP out there that could possibly help him with the swing states was Hillary Clinton. And obviously I'm in the minority. Um, but when you look at Ohio, Florida, Pennsylvania, you know, Hillary ran powerfully in those states. And right now McCain, what does he have, like an eight-point lead in Florida? Ooh, I don't know. I, I thought the latest one just had him had him just barely beating McCain for the first time. Oh, really? Time. Okay, so he's coming up. You know, these polls. You know, I the way I look at, at all this polling right now, and and may, and uh, you can comment too on this, which is they really start taking hold after the conventions and then the first debate. After that first debate, I think things really change big time um, because. You know, if you remember, Bush had a huge lead after the Republican National Convention just eviscerated Kerry. And it was after that first debate that he looked actually more presidential than George Bush, and he looked like a good choice, and it brought the, the polls down. So right now it's very all over the place. It is kind of freaky, right? You see uh, one day the Gallup poll has Obama up by eight. The next day it's even. It's kind of freaky. But um, anyway, so I went on a limb and said I'd like Hillary Clinton because she's a fighter. Now, um, I'm hearing, the word that I'm hearing is that it might be Evan Bai. Oh, I don't, I don't think it'll be I Evan know, Bai. That's sort of what I've just heard uh, from the underground, where people thinking that he's leading towards Evan Bai. So what, what, what are you looking for in, in, a, uh, in a VP choice? Because reading the, the progressive blogs, the, the Matt Stoles and Chris Bowers, they, they were looking for a, a, vi a vice president choice as kind of a, a signal as to what an Obama administration would be like. So like Chris Bowers said, uh, it, it, if he picked uh, Tim Kaine, it would also uh, signal that Obama has no intention to govern as a progressive, 
And Matt Iglesias kind of took offense to that and said, no, that's not true. Ronald Reagan's selection of George W. H. W. Bush uh, more presaged Bush becoming a conservative than Reagan a moderate. And instead, Matt argued that the best guide to how Obama intends to govern isn't who he picks as vice president. It's the stuff he says. So are, are you kind of – are you looking at, at his, his, his choice of vice president as kind of a signal as to what – type of administration he's going to run, or, or yeah, what's your I don't, concern? You know, to be honest with you, the reason why I, I, I picked Hillary, because I want to win, okay? Um, I'm not sure, uh, look, Obama, you know, it, it's going to be his administration, and I understand there's a lot of problems on the Clinton side for him, but um, like, but he is the presidential nominee. So I don't think that if he, whoever he picks is going to be an indication of how he's going to run his administration. Um, you know, because he's looking, you're, you're looking to balance the ticket, you're looking to have another face out there, you know, fundraising, going on, talking about campaigning for you. And the way I look at it is I want somebody that's going to help bring in some states, that's going to have an effect, that's going to draw people in, that's going to articulate your vision clearly. And, um, and so, so that's where, you know, that's where I stand on a VP choice. Um, does it give signals? I don't. I don't particularly buy that. Um, I think that when a president's in office, um, you know, then you start making the real choices, and we'll see how the Congress breaks. But myself, I'm hoping that he will govern more progressively than he's shown so far. Well, speaking of Congress breaking and uh, Democrats governing in certain ways once they're in power, uh, Glenn Greenwald uh, started a, a little little firestorm between him and. Uh, some of the more center-left uh, people on the uh, blogosphere with uh, a post uh, that he wrote about kicking the blue dogs out of the party. And uh, he starts by citing uh, the uh, single-digit congressional approval ratings, also showing that uh, you know Fox News had a poll that showed Democrats um, are most unpopular among uh, – the Democratic Congress is most unpopular among, among Democrats themselves. And then he goes into a, a laundry list of, of failed failures of the Democratic Congress – including uh, unlimited and unconditional funding for the Iraq War, vast new warrantless eavesdropping powers and retroactive amnesty for telecom donors, uh, measures the administration tried but failed to obtain from the GOP Congress, the ability to ignore congressional subpoenas with utter impunity, a resolution formally decreeing parts of the Iranian government to be a terrorist organization, a failure to outlaw waterboarding, to apply the torture ban to the CIA, to restore habeas corpus, to abolish the Military Commission Acts, to impose the requirement of congressional approval before President Bush can attack Iran, confirmation of highly controversial Bush nominees, including Michael Mukasey as Attorney General, even after he embraced most of the radical Bush theories of executive power. Uh, and so then his solution to all this is to decrease the influence of the conservative blue dog contingent within the Democratic caucus, and that means running progressive challengers against them in primaries or targeting them with critical ads, even if doing so in isolated cases risks the loss of Democratic seats in Congress. So, uh, are you are you on board with this kick the blue blue dogs out campaign? Well, you know, we've um, at, at Blue America, which is a PAC that uh, that's a very successful PAC um, with uh, that's myself and, and Fire Dog Lake and, and uh, Digby at Hullabaloo and Howie Klein. We've been, you know, if you look at our Act Blue page, we are one of the top fundraising um, you know packs around on, on Act Blue. And what we've done is target. Blue dogs, because um, they tend to important issues to vote with the Republicans. So we, you know, part of the mission for Blue America is to promote progressive ideas, even in areas that sometimes might not. You know, you might say, well, this district is is a waste, right? Uh, don't do anything there. But it's also, I think, important to get a progressive message out to different areas, um, so that people who there are progressives there, there are liberals there, there are Democrats there. And so we've been targeting blue dogs our whole campaign um, because, you know, to change the party, uh, you know, the, if you look at the Democratic Party, you know, it's not like the Republican Party. I mean, after the delay and Newt Gingrich got, got finished with them, I mean, you know, are there is, it, well, tell me some of the caucuses that have any power in the Republican, in the Republican Party. I mean, they are, they are so authoritarian. They are like, in other words, they take their orders for the most part. And you don't have a big split, different coalitions like you do in the Democratic uh, Party, so it's it's trickier to maneuver. And uh, you know what they probably needed was uh, their own version of a a, a not a, a corrupt Tom Delay, right? You need 
right? Because Tom DeLay really whipped that Republican Party senseless. And now he's out because he was so corrupt. But um, you don't have that in the Democratic side. So what we've done is take on what we feel are blue dogs that are not voting the right way on issues that we find important. And, and I mean, we've had, you know, Blue America alone has, in the 06, I think we back like 14 winners, and which is really good for a new pack. Um, I, I'm not into it just to, to go after winners, right? I mean, but um, but we did really well. And so the, the pack has a lot of goodwill. So, yes, we are targeting blue dogs. Um, we, all, we all have differing opinions on this approach uh, as far as how far to take it, where to take it. Um, and, and, I mean, myself personally, um, I will not want to give a seat to a Republican. And that's just, you know, my opinion. Um, I will go after the blue dogs, and we did. We ran ads against Chris Carney. Uh, we told them we were doing it. We gave him a chance to change his vote, and then we ran ads. And, and we made a strong statement. The readers in the blogosphere made a strong statement. They donated a lot of money to our pack with Glenn, um, all, you know, a, a big part of it. And we were able to run full-page ads in the Washington Post, uh, we ran ads against Barrow down in Georgia. We really were proactive because that's what you need. Um, you know, you need, you know, people don't want to just feel like they, they're uh, useless, like they're helpless. And so a pack like ours takes proactive action. And so I think it's a good thing to go after Blue Dogs, um, you know, especially, you know, my goal is more to go after them in primary challenges and replace them because it's a, it's a process, you know. And, yeah. And I mean... So, like, we're, we're, almost, we're almost in agreement, you know, and uh, Mike Glenn is a really good friend of mine, and, and he's a great guy. And what I find interesting is that, you know, the, the right-wing bloggers, I mean, they hate Glenn. So, it's, it's you know, just like they sort of, you know, I, don't, I won't say they hate me uh, because I have a lot of, you know, I, I talk to a lot of right-wing bloggers, but uh, they don't, because they know I'm, I'm uh, you know, what I put on my site is, you know, you might not agree with it, but it's honest. Um, but they, you know, so like the fact that they're actually talking about one of his top posts and debating about it to me is kind of hilarious because they're always looking to attack him every step of the way. So now they oh, yeah, go, Glenn. You know, we like that plan. Yes. Well, that, that's actually one of the, uh, the posts I was going to talk about. It was the, the next right. Uh, Sean Oxendine has a post called Go, Glenn Go. Glenn, Go. And uh, he, he looks at the uh, Democratic uh, PVIs, the uh, partisan voting index of uh, – Democrats that don't always vote uh, the way the way Glenn likes them to, and um, he just assumes. Uh, well, he's, he has a longer post, but in his formulation, he, he assumes that during during this year, the uh, Democratic majority is going to increase to a 50 seat margin. But he looks beyond that and saying, uh, you know, using uh, if going from that point on, uh, people like the Glenn Greenwalds and the, the Blue Americans of the world started to uh, target um, Democrats uh, that did not vote uh, their way. Um, he says, using this metric, we see immediately 26 Democrats who would likely find themselves seriously jeopardized if they began voting the Democratic Party line. If these Democrats were knocked out and knocked out and openly progressive members of Congress ran in their place, these districts would almost certainly flip to Republicans, assuming that Republicans ran halfway competent candidates. Uh, the bottom line is that this permanent majority mentality is exactly the mentality that led Republicans to defeat in 2006. The Democratic majority is more precarious than, net, than the net roots think, and if Obama wins in 2008, they could easily lose that majority in tw 2010, which is, of course, exactly what happened to, to Clinton in, in 92 mm -hmm. with Republican takeover in 94. So does that does that worry you at all? I mean, I, you, you were talking about Barrow before. Do you, do you worry that if you ran a openly progressive person in, in Barrow's seat, you might lose that seat to a Republican, and that if, if this happened on, on a wider scale? Well, my goal, you know, to me is never to... Uh, Never to elect a Republican, um, you know that that that's not that's a part that I'm not on board on. But um, but you have to you know what see what we found also is that the system you know doesn't work properly all the time. Okay, and so you have to start taking actions, or you're just going to sit there and nothing will happen. And so you know we're taking actions to try to change things. And yes, they're going to be slow. And we all have opinions on what could happen. And we can run out these metrics and we can figure, well, you know, this will flip or that will flip or you could lose that. Um, but we don't really know what would happen. 
Now, um, I believe that the goal of the Republicans, because I, I believe that coming into this election, they kind of threw in, you know, it was like, yeah, just let John McCain go out there because, you know, we're going to lose. And because uh, it always it always surprised me how long it took the right wing talk radio stations to all of a sudden like endorse Mitt Romney. I think it was right before Florida. All of a sudden they all went like you know Gaga for Romney. All of a sudden he was a conservative. You know, I mean, but um, and it, it like so they knew that this was going to be a really tough year for the Republicans. But their goal for sure is 2010. And 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 let's face it, the mess that's going to be behind. And if Obama gets in, if McCain gets in, it's, it's, it's going to be an incredible nightmare. But if, let's just say, Obama gets in, the mess that he's going to have to deal with, do you honestly, does anybody believe that he's going to fix everything in two years? And the Republicans in Congress will... Well, they sure hope well, he we, will. I mean, he's going to try, but let's be realistic. He's going to enact... But, but, but how do you dig out of a you know, trillion dollars debt, billions of dollars in, in such a short amount of time? And you know that the Republicans will, will block everything as, so that they will make it a stagnant, do-nothing Congress so that then they could take it back in 2010. That's the plan. I mean, I believe that's their plan. Do you think that's their plan? Um, yes. I mean, it would have to be, right. right? I mean, that's that, that's the game, game, you know, which is they're not – look, if, if McCain wins the presidency, I think they'll all be shocked, to be honest with you. Um, but, um, I'm going to go ahead and agree right. with you there. But if – but, you know, but if uh, – so they're looking to 2010, and uh, you know what I just saw? It was kind of interesting. Have you watched that show Mad Men yet? You know what? I uh, I don't shell out for uh, the extra HBO and Showtime. It's not. It was on, it's on AMC. Yeah, really? At – I thought it was on no, Showtime. No, it's on AMC. You know, it's actually uh, um, HBO passed on the series. Oh. And so it's on AMC. And if you, what's great about Netflix is that they have every TV series. And I kind of, like, started a thing on my website where I call it Cycling. And, like, you know, if it's on a weekend or something, uh, you, you know, you just go, you just watch, like, four or five episodes, like, back to back to back. Right, it's right, right. It's just the best viewing experience you can have for a series, if it's a good series. So I just did that with uh, with the show, and and what's really interesting, it's it's it starts in the late fifties, and there's episodes around the Nixon Kennedy, um, you know, election campaign, and these ad right. men are all Republicans. So it was like when you know they were up all night waiting for the results, and it looked like you know they were saying, well, it looks like you know we got Chicago, and blah blah blah, and and the old, the the oh, the main partner was like, you know what, you, you know. Nixon will live to fight another day. It's okay. In other words, they always plan ahead. Do you know what I mean? Like they use well, defeat. You, you you have to. I mean, when, but they're. You? But I mean, they're so good at it. Like in other words, they, they you know they think in so many years ahead. And then what happened? Nixon came back. I mean, it might have, now. Do you see Democratic politicians like you know like get a re get a rerun, get a do over, and run for president? Uh, I don't know. Hillary has reserved, you know, Hillary twenty twelve. Well, you, uh, you know, it's. I mean, that that's to me a lot of that is just a lot of nonsense, you know, because I, I won't even. We can talk someday about the media's coverage of the Clintons and, and Obama, um, and I stayed neutral. I have to tell you this: it was the best decision I made um, while covering the primary, because I felt, for my site, you know, it's we, we get we get a lot of people, and, and also a lot of right wing people come on because I don't. I don't block them for, you know, as long as it's... Well, sick. plus you also have good video. Right. That's what and I so, think. right. So, I mean, you know, I figured out, you know, what... It, so I have a, you know, a nice core audience. And um, and when I decided to stay neutral, it was before, you know, it's when all the nominees were up there. First of all, you get, obviously, all the ridiculous pie fights that I want to be involved in. But by doing that, you know, I have credibility to my readers, to the bloggers, and to the media, because I'm, you know... I. I you know, Crick's is, is fairly embedded also. And, um, you know, I have credibility now bringing up topics and, and, and saying stuff about candidates because, I, you know, I felt that they need to, to earn my vote. Um, they need to earn my support. And it's just, it was really interesting to watch the whole Internet go on with, with the, the whole primary. It was fascinating. And I really studied the media. So um, it was, you can see that there was this hatred. I never realized that. I knew that the right wing had hated the Clintons. I'm sorry, I'm going off into another topic. Um, and Apparently, we're, we're on yeah, our way. Anyway, I'll go back, I'll get off. All I'm saying is I did not realize, and I, I never thought Hillary would have a shot. 
You know, I, I just thought that, and also in the beginning, I thought it was a bad move because of the angry right, and I did not realize that they would have to fight the press as much as they did, um, you know, the campaign. And it was, it's a sad moment. I mean, a lot of people have written about it, and, and we'll move on from that. But um, anyway, so let, let's go on to another topic, because I don't <laughs> Well, I, I just wanted to kind of finish up that, uh, I mean, as far as, as, far as the Blue Dog go, uh, uh, Armando, or, or Big Ten Democrat at, at Talk Left, uh, kind of talked about what he would like to see, because, you know, he was he was very active in uh, uh, targeting Lieberman with Lamont, and so he, he kind of put forward this formulation, is, uh, you know, we, we, we definitely should be targeting some of them in primaries, but th- this is how he wants to be selective, is um, he says, first of all, what, we need to target candidates that are worth fighting for. That means one who is fighting for your issues, and winning and losing is not always the important end. Ned Lamont's campaign changed the debate on Iraq across the country. Don Edwards won on the issues we are supposed to care about. Marcy Winograd made and made Jane Harmon a more progressive politician. Fear of a primary moved Ellen, Telsh, Ellen Tauscher to the left. But consider those races. Uh, consider where they, those races were won in blue state America. What races should be avoided? For starters, ones where there is no candidate fighting for our values, such as Travis Childers in Mississippi, he goes on. And he specifically says, other races to avoid? Ones where our views simply have no traction. That John Barrow race was ri- ridiculous to target. So, you know, I, I, I kind of agree with Armando here. No, in yeah, that, he, he, um, makes a, he makes a lot of good points. Right. Is that... Is that I mean, he, he makes... Know, one, see, one, this, that's what I mean. It, it, they were all so close and with just subtle differences. Do you know what I'm saying? And see, well, I, no, did, that, I, I mean, when, think, when you have resources, there, the, these differences are important as far as right. targeting goes. But what I'm saying, like, I did not think that it was a waste of time to go after the Barrow district um, because you're still, you know, you're still making a statement. You know, I don't care. I mean, I'm not in this, so I have the Beltway cheering me on, okay? I don't care about what the D.C. insiders think. That's not why I blog, and that's not why my readers read me, and that's why, not why they donated over a million dollars to our pack. You know, if you go to, to, you know, the, what is it called? The Republican, the slate card, you know, you see like slate $30 card. a year, you know, $50 there. I mean, we've raised over a million dollars, and, and they're not interested in, in A, what, what the insiders say, what DC says. What we're interested in also, just, it's just part of the mission, okay? It's just, it's not the whole mission, but we didn't feel, that it was a bad thing because people didn't even know that Barrow had a challenger and people didn't know all his positions. So how are you supposed to know in whatever district it is, um, you know, uh, you target, how are they supposed to know really the issues that like a John Barrow stands for? You know, uh, um, you know, how many people in your district, I mean, I know you're in the heart of it so everybody knows everything, but just in, in across America, um, half the time the people go in the booth and they look at names and they're not even, they don't even know what these people stand for. And so by putting out messaging to say this is what this person stands for, you make, and I think, a very powerful statement, whether it was in a losing cause or a winning cause. And that has an effect. And this whole process is going to take time. It's not going to change overnight. I, I, I have a very similar argument kind of in, in favor of what, of what Glenn's doing, but, but slightly different, is that I don't think it necessarily helps you in, in, in with, with confusing the voters in Barrow's district that progressives have, have a good message or that they're right about anything. However, I, I do think that it does create um, a sense of action that you're doing something, and it does involve Glenn's readers and uh, your readers and Jane's readers in more of a sense that they're doing something, and by, by putting their money in, it increases their stake in the movement. It increases the chances that they'll give money in the future and builds an infrastructure to help the message further on down the line. So, so in that sense... You know, whenever, whenever I, this is something I definitely uh, kind of learned with the Lamont Lieberman experience is that I always thought from the beginning that that was a complete waste for the Night Roads to totally be focusing on Lieberman like mm-hmm. that, and they eventually lost. But at the same time, they they got so much exposure, they brought so many more people into the campaign, they they kept their cause alive, they kept uh, ish, the the Iraq issue at the forefront. It it really grew the pie of resources. So that when, when Glenn goes out and raises money to attack, you know, the John Barrows of the world, I don't know that that necessarily is taking resources out of a set pie. I think it is instead 
kind of a long-term investment move well, to yes, expand I, the pot. I agree. You know, I mean, I, I agree with you. And the whole and, and remember, I mean, you know, Joe Lieberman is not a member of the Democratic Party any longer. And it took Republican resources to help him win that state. And I don't know if you've seen the polls, but, you know, he's not doing... I did. He's, he's uh, They hate right. him up there. And, you know, and, and his whole thing about, you know, 18 years and now I'm an agent of change. I mean, you know, look, it's just a joke, you know, and he's a complete joke. Um, and so that was a fight worth fighting. And again, if you would have gone to the D.C. Insider, and if you would have gone to the Beltway, and if you would have asked the media people, should we go out to Joe Lieberman? They would have said we were crazy and wasting our time. They right? did. I was one but of them. But what happened, and you know, you laid it out very nice. I mean, which is that it starts a movement, gets people involved, but they see that we're, act- we're just not writing and typing words and, and all that. You know, we are actually becoming a movement, and people get, um, you know, get psyched, and they want to be part of this. And that's why we keep doing actions and keep being pro- proactive. You know, we just did a campaign, I don't know if you read about it, against Freedom's Watch. Um, you know, we got, uh, you know, the, the, the mainstream media covered it. But they were running um, ads, uh, you know, calls against um, what they thought were possible the toss-up Democratic congressmen. And so they ran these calls, and we got Mike Farrell from MASH. Oh, the calls, and right. And so we, we recorded our own calls, and it was kind of funny and uh, and so we went in and, you know, because we went after Ari Fleischer's. I mean, these guys are these billionaire, you know, guys that throw all this money into this 520, you know, into this political pack. And, um, and we went up against them. And people say, bravo. You know, and, and so it is. It is a movement builder. And, and it's, it's just growing. And it's just it's sort of morphing. And, and, and we are, I think, um, learning as, as, you know, and everybody has their own select opinions. I'm just speaking for myself, you know. Uh, and, and others have very strong opinions. Matt Stoller, who you just did a, a, an interview with, is, is really in there. And I love Matt. And, and, uh, and he's got his strong opinions. Jane is a smart, brilliant person. She's got hers. Glenn has got, has got her takes. And we're all sort of merging in ways. And I think it's exciting, if anything else. Whether we're doing it the exact right way or not, it's really exciting and the readers are feeding it. Just look at how much money we raise. It's incredible. It is. It is. It's definitely opened the insider's eyes here. Um, so I think I think that's a good place to, to end our first session here, well, John. cool. It's, uh, you know, it was uh, a lot of fun. I'm a Sicilian, so I don't mind talking. Uh, we'll see how this... Uh, the video looks, but uh, it was it was fun, Con, and I think that you well, know that I do this, you know, I like to do it some more. It'd be kind of fun. Well, in, enjoy the rest of your uh, sunny Southern California uh, day. You know, I got the Yankees. Got to beat the Angels tonight. That's my that's my goal. <laughs> Fair All enough, right, buddy. Okay. Talk okay. To you later. Bye.